Hi there, everyone. My name is Pirak Juthani. I'm an internal medicine resident at Stanford, and today I just want to talk about how to give effective oral presentations um, for both interns as well as medical students. This is still something that I'm working on a bit, and um, it can be very overwhelming when you first start. And so I wanted to make this video to break down the tips and tricks that I think have helped me over time, and I hope also help you. Uh, before we start, I will start with a brief overview of what an oral presentation is in terms of presenting in a hospital setting um, and talking about patients. And then I'm going to go down into the four sections of the oral presentation that I think can really help make life a little easier. Oral presentations are basically what happen when you, as the person taking care of a patient, want to convey information about that patient to someone else on your team. You want to be concise, but you also want to be informative. There's a very fine balance between having too much detail, having too little detail, and having just enough detail. Long presentations can be really tough because they can prolong rounds and sometimes you can give a lot of information and it's very tough to tease out what's important and what's not. Very brief presentations can also not be great because it often provides us with not enough information to know what is the best course of plan for the patient. So today I'm gonna to show you how to find a balance between both of those. And you might be wondering, how do you even find that sweet spot? And the way you find the sweet spot is by telling or trying to tell a story in a very um, organized fashion, right? When you're giving an oral presentation, it's similar to almost trying to tell a story about what you think is going on with the patient here and why you think we should do what you think we should do. And in a way, as I said, the best way to do it is thinking about it in a very, heuris very focused approach. So here is the general format I like to always start with. And the way that I break it down is a one-liner, which means how do you summarize this patient in just one line? So you say, hey, to start today, I'm gonna to talk about Mr. Jones. He's a 64-year-old with COPD, asthma, as well as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction presenting with dyspnea on exertion, right? So that's the one-liner for the patient. Then you can usually go into interval events. What did we do to this patient yesterday in terms of what are the big treatments we gave them? What did we opt to do? Do we consult any services? And then did anything happen to the patient overnight? You're assuming that the patient has been in the hospital for a while, so that's when interval events can be important because you always want to remind everyone what happened yesterday. Uh, before you get into what you're thinking about doing today. And unfortunately in the hospital, as you'll know, things that we often do to patients can be very relevant to how their course ends up doing. So if, for example, we diurese the patient yesterday, you wanna see how much volume they put out and make sure that their, their, their electrolytes are okay. And then I usually like to go into a presentation using the SOAP format, S-O-A-P, Subjective, Objective, Assessment, and Plan. And I'm gonna break all of these down for you. As I said, a one-liner can be very tough to piece together, but I tried to create a formula for a one-liner and it's been present in some of my other videos. This is not always going to be the best way to create a one-liner, but if you're if you're worried and you don't know where to start, this is probably a good way to start it. The way I like to think about it is the rule of threes. In a one-liner, you want to have try to have three pertinent pieces of the past medical history, three parts of the HPI, which is the history of present illness and ultimately talks a bit about why the patient presented, and then three lab data points. So for example, uh, this is a 57-year-old male with type 2 diabetes. His A1C is 8, right? This shows me you know what you're talking about when you talked about diabetes. You're telling me they have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and you're including the ejection fraction here, 25%, and then colon cancer, and you're including here if they had any procedures such as a colectomy. And the patient is presenting with subacute dyspnea on exertion with negative troponins, as well as CTPE concerning for heart failure exacerbation. So you're seeing here that there's three pieces of the patient's past medical history that are relevant, right? The patient has dyspnea on exertion. That's why it's important to know they have heart failure. Could this be a heart failure exacerbation? It's important to know that they had a history of colon cancer because this could be potentially recurrent cancer sometimes, right? And it's important to know that they have diabetes because individuals with diabetes, if their glucose are not well controlled, can present in a variety of ways. And then you'll see here that I included um, the big reason they're presenting, which is the dyspnea on exertion, as well as the negative troponins. And this is important because what you're telling me is you don't think this is a underlying ACS-like event, right? You don't think this is acute coronary syndrome, but you do think this is subacute dyspnea on exertion. And then you'll see that there's also a CTPE um, result finding here that shows that um, CTPE didn't show any findings of a PE, but there was concern for maybe heart failure in the sense that maybe the lungs looked like there was fluid in them. Okay, so this is a one-liner, and as I 
I said, you can create a good one-liner by just having the age, gender, three pieces of the past medical history, three pieces of what they presented with, and then three lab data points that can really piece the patient together. Then I try to always do interval events. And the reason why it's important to do interval events, because the things that we did to the patient yesterday are going to be very relevant to what we do today. So yesterday, for example, for this patient, this exact patient that you're seeing at the top right, you'll see that in terms of interval events, yesterday we consulted cardiology, we gave 40 of IV Lasix, and we added on some goal-directed medical therapy. We also concerted endocrinology for consideration of a GLP-1 agonist in an outpatient setting. So you can see here that this now zones people in into what we were doing for this patient yesterday. It's like, oh, wow, we were actually um, diuresing the patient, and then we added on some GDMT. Interesting. And then overnight, it seems that the patient was mildly hypoxic, up to two liters on nasal cannula, but the chest x-ray that they got overnight was within normal limits. So now you're, again, keying the, keying the entire listening crowd onto what happened yesterday, and do we need to be worried about this? For example, if this was patient requiring insane amounts of oxygen, chest x-ray showed that there was significant pulmonary edema, you'd look at it very differently than the way you're looking at it here. Okay, so as I said, now we've talked about the one-liner, we have now talked about the interval events, now let's break it up into a subjective objective assessment and plan. This is the next portion of the oral presentation. Subjective is exactly what it sounds like. How is the patient feeling today? Are there any concerns from you having seen the patient this morning? So you can just say subjectively this morning the patient looks X, the patient feels X. That way we know exactly how the patient is subjectively feeling. Next up, we have the objective data. Here you can literally just go down the objective data, but it is important to try to do it in a very specific way. Um, you don't always have to follow this way, but I personally like to do the vitals first because the vitals are so important in telling us how the patient's doing. Blood pressure, are they hypotensive? What's their MAP? Uh, temperature, are they febrile? Heart rate, are they tachycardic or bradycardic? Are they saturating well on room air? Are they 99%? Are they saturating well on uh, 15 liters of oxygen? Very different types of patients. Then you can also talk about the labs from this morning. Usually some patient might have a CBC. If we're worried about bleeding, is the patient's hemoglobin in the right direction? If we're worried about infection, do they have a new leukocytosis? You can talk about the relevant labs, specifically for heart failure, for example. If we've been diuresing this patient, it would be important to know if they're getting hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic, especially because those need to be repleted and those electrolytes can cause disturbances. And the last one is the I's and O's. That's another thing that can be relevant for certain patients. If we're diuresing a patient, we want to know how much volume have they put out. I's and O's stand for ins and outs, right? If you're diuresing someone, you want to make sure that they're putting out more than they're taking in because you want to get some of that fluid off. So those are some of the objective data that I try to include. Then we have the assessment. So now you want to basically take everything we've talked about and put it together and try to figure out what you want to do today. It can be very similar to the one-liner, but it usually will uh, help us figure out a plan. So you can say, hey, this is our 57-year-old male with the relevant past medical history I already mentioned. He was admitted with what I think is heart failure exacerbation. This morning, his oxygen saturation is now downtrending to two liters from five liters when he first came in. His chest x-ray looks a bit more clean based on on what we saw yesterday and so I do think we're headed in the right direction but his weight is still quite high it's about five pounds higher than his baseline so I think we should consider diuresing today and we can continue to check his electrolytes in the morning to make sure he's not dropping too low so this is your assessment this literally tells me exactly what you're thinking of doing by piecing everything together from the like from the several things we just talked about then you have the plan the plan is something that I like to make sure um, I go through very explicitly because even though this patient might be here for heart failure, they probably have other comorbidities that we need to make sure we're managing. So for example, I usually literally go into the plan portion of my oral presentation and I say, hey, for my plan, um, I will be going through it by problem. I hope that's okay. And when I say that, usually most people are fine with it. And when I say we go through every, everything by problem, the first problem, I always start with whatever's most relevant. So if they're here for a heart failure exacerbation, I say, okay, for the first problem, the patient has a heart failure exacerbation. Here's how we're treating that. For the second problem, the patient has diabetes. Here's how we're treating that. And the third problem, patient now has a history of colon cancer status post colectomy. Here's how we're treating that. And by actually going through the whole problem list, you're making sure that the patient does not, um, we don't forget any aspect of this patient's care. And so as you'll see that a lot of 
oral presentations go down to really thinking thoroughly about patients. And the one thing that you can do to go above and beyond on your oral presentations is to think about disposition. So yes, the patient is here right now. How do you think they're going to eventually get out of the hospital? Do you think they're going to need to go to a nursing home or do you think they're safe enough to go home? Try to focus on the underlying cause of what could be causing the patient's underlying uh, issues. So in this case, if it's heart failure, why does the patient have heart failure, right? And then you can try to always do stuff that your their primary care doctor would do just because it's important that this patient would get set up with a primary care doctor at the time of discharge so they can follow up on all the great stuff you did for them in the hospital. So with that being said, I hope this provided a good 20,000 foot overview into how to create an effective oral presentation. As I said, I try to make sure we do a one-liner, try to focus on the interval events. Then I try to go into the subjective, objective assessment and plan to try to keep everything very, very focused. So if you like this video, please drop a like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.